Hello and welcome back. In this video, I will continue talking about the Catholic Church and her idols and pagan symbols that she's developed and adopted as a part of her worship over the many, many decades. Catholics have accepted these things as part of their worship because they think the Pope represents the Christian Church in modern times. This is what happens when people follow men and organize religion. All organized religions have a hierarchy set in place to tell others how to think, how to dress, and how to worship, and how to interpret the Bible. In the Old Testament, in Psalms chapter 146, verse 3, it says here, Do not put your trust in rulers, in a son of man in whom there is no deliverance. His breath departs, he returns to the ground, and that day his thoughts perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in Yahweh his God, creator of the heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Under the Old Covenant, the Israelites could only follow the written word of God that God gave them through Moses and the prophets. No one could say, follow me, not even the greatest prophets like Moses or Elijah or John the Baptist, and so forth. God's word alone was the light for their path, as mentioned in Psalms 119, verse 105. But Jesus came and initiated a new covenant, and he gave us not only the word of God, but an example to follow by his own life. He was the first person in the Bible to say, follow me, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, John 21, 19, Luke 9, verse 23, and other places. So in the New Covenant, we have both the written word and also the word made in flesh, Jesus Christ. Or in other words, the written word made visible in a human life to guide us. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees of his day for merely studying the word of God, but not coming to him. He said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But they testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me to have life. As stated in John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40. In the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit also inspired a godly man like the Apostle Paul to say, follow me as I follow Christ. And the Holy Spirit made him say that three times to emphasize the fact that we should also follow the example of truly godly men who follow in Christ's footsteps. Examples of that are in 1 Corinthians 4.16, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. The twelve apostles were all examples of godly men who we can imitate because they followed Christ. A true new covenant servant not only proclaims God's standard in the written word, but also says, as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. The word of God also commands us to obey our leaders and to imitate their faith. In Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the result of their conduct or their life and imitate their faith. We submit to them only because they follow Jesus' example. And that's the only reason we do. We're not called to follow a person's ministry because God gives each of his children a unique ministry that others cannot have. Christ's body has members with different functions, just like our human body has. When Jesus called people to follow him, he did not expect them to do miracles and so forth. That was his ministry. He called people to follow the example of his life, that is, to live by the principles by which he lived. Likewise, when Paul called believers to imitate him and follow him as he followed Christ, he was not asking them to be apostles or to heal the sick but to live as he lived, by the principles by which Christ lived. It is the Holy Spirit who has commanded us, the above verses, to follow the examples of godly men. So following the examples of godly men is encouraged in the Bible, but following men who encourage idolatry and teach lies can have very disastrous results for us as Christians. We know this because immediately after telling the Philippian Christians to follow his own example and the example of other godly men in Philippians 3, verse 17, Paul warned them not to follow the example of some others. He says, For many walk, of whom I have often told you, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Have the popes of the Catholic Church followed Christ, do you think? The Catholic Church claims that apostolic succession came through the Roman Catholic Church with the Pope as the successor of Peter and have succeeded to the place of the apostles. 
this is a pretty bold claim for anyone to make, that we should question the claim that the Pope is an apostle is not irreverent or forbidden, but actually necessary. For Scripture tells us that there have been men claimed to be apostles and were not. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 12 through 15 says, But what I do, I will also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. It would appear from what Jesus said to the church at Ephesus that he expects us to challenge anyone's claim to apostleship and he commends the believers in Ephesus for doing so. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, Jesus says here, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, that you cannot tolerate evil men, and that you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. So just because a process is enacted that seems very religious and steeped in tradition does not mean that it's from God. It could just as easily be from Satan, the devil, and his demons. Paul has just warned us that Satan and his servants transform themselves into ministers. Yes, Satan and those who do his will look very religious, claim to be ministers. If you think this is all unkind, just remember that the claim of the Roman Catholic Church is that the Supreme Pontiff, as he is called, is pastor of the entire Church of God and can wield his power in unhindered matters of God. He pretty much can do anything he wants. Sadly, Catholics believe this to be true because they don't put this concept of the popes to the test. Here's what the Catholic Church itself says about its popes in the Catechism Book of the Catholic Church, Part 1, Section 2, Chapter 3, Article 9, Paragraph 4. Here's what the Church says. The Pope, Bishop of Rome, and Peter's successor is the perpetual and visible source and foundation of the unity both of the bishops and of the whole company of the faithful. Continues on. For the Roman Pontiff, by reason of his office as Vicar of Christ, and as pastor of the entire church has full, supreme, and universal power over the whole church, a power which he can always exercise unhindered. So that's what they say in their catechism book about the Pope. So Catholics give a man the power over their church instead of Jesus Christ. God has given us his word, and through it we are to test all things. 1 Thessalonians 5, chapter, chapter 5, verse 21. This isn't a matter of being nasty or unkind. It's a matter of truth. Over 1.4 billion people on earth look to an office holder called the Pope, whose position is not found in Scripture and whose life does not bear the signs of those we know to have been apostles in the New Testament. The apostolic age is over. The Pope is not an apostle, and those of us who know God's truth must be willing to boldly say so. Jesus would not appoint as an apostle a man who worships many idols and venerates pagan symbols and who teaches lies as church doctrine. We've already seen in part one of this video series on the Catholic Church the pagan background of the Pope's vestments and the vestments of the other clergy in the Catholic Church. I will take a closer look at the depth of idolatry that this supposed apostle of Christ encourages his flock to worship. First, I want to further discuss the false teaching of the apostolic succession. So the Catholic Church teaches that the Apostle Peter was the first pope, and that there has been a succession, one after the other, of popes that followed Peter. One example of this is found within the foyer of many Catholic churches. As you walk in the front door of a Catholic church, many times you see a series of large plaques that dominate the main wall. Here's an example of that in this picture. On each plaque is the name of a pope. Starting with the current living pope, they trace the names of every pope sequentially back in history, supposedly to the apostle Peter, who they claim was the first pope. Yet the office of pope did not exist for the first 600 years of history. Pope Gregory the Great, who ruled from A.D. 590 to 604, was the first to really have papal powers, 
so that even kings sought his approval and his blessing. This concept of apostolic succession is just a powerful deception to the masses, for historically and biblically this is simply untrue according to Scripture. The Catholic Church prides itself as the original church that Jesus started in 33 AD, and that all other denominations broke away from them and are therefore deviant. Catholics are led to believe from their priests that if they were to be transported back in time to, to 100 AD, they would be able to attend a Catholic church just like the ones that exist today. Facts of history, however, paint an entirely different picture because the Roman Catholic Church in its present organizational structure, as I mentioned, did not exist prior to approximately 600 AD. No one is a successor to the apostles and has their authority today because no one is inspired by the Holy Spirit today to do so. The last true apostle was the apostle John. Here's a picture of John, artist depiction, when John was on the Isle of Patmos in 96 CE. Most Bible scholars agree that John left the Isle of Patmos where he was banished for preaching the gospel as mentioned in Revelation chapter 1 verse 9. The last living original disciple then spent his remaining days in Ephesus until he died somewhere around the close of the first century. After his death, there were no further apostles to succeed him according to the Bible. The possession of the Holy Spirit is the factor that determined the apostles' authority. They had the power to bind and loose, forgive and retain, because God was speaking through them. On that basis only were they enabled to unerringly deliver God's message to mankind. How can anyone claim to have authority such as theirs being their successors when they are not inspired by the Holy Spirit? Furthermore, the apostles and those on whom they laid their hands could speak with tongues, prophesy, and work miracles. They worked miracles to demonstrate their authority to show that they were indeed inspired of God. In defense of his own authority, the apostle Paul said, Indeed, the signs of the apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in miracles and wonders and deeds of power, stated in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. No one can work miracles today as the original apostles did. Thus, no one is inspired today, and no one has the same authority today as the apostles had. The popes of the Catholic Church have never had the miraculous powers of the twelve apostles. When the apostles received the Holy Spirit, from that time forward, they could do the miracles just like Jesus performed. They could even raise people from the dead like Christ himself could do. Now, when has a pope ever had the power to resurrect a person or perform other powerful miracles? Another very important qualification to become an apostle was you had to be an eyewitness of Jesus Christ himself. Paul defended his apostleship by saying, Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Stated in 1 Corinthians 9.1. The apostles were indeed witnesses in the fullest sense. They were the eyewitnesses carefully chosen by Jesus Christ himself who would witness to mankind what they saw and heard concerning Jesus. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the very ends of the earth. In Acts chapter 26, Paul mentions his account of seeing Jesus. Verse 2 says, On one such occasion I was traveling to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. When at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven greater than the brightness of the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard on you to be kicking against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you a minister and a witness, both of the things you have seen and of the things about which I will appear to you. I will deliver you from the people and from the Gentiles to whom I send you, to open their eyes so that they turn from darkness to light and from the power of the adversary to God, so that they receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are made holy by their trust in me. So the Apostle Paul was indeed an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter declared, 
For we were not following fictitious tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his grandeur, stated in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16. So the Bible doesn't teach succession to the apostles. Peter plainly declared that the things of Christ would be recalled through his writings. The inspired writings of the Bible, therefore, are the only infallible succession that we have from the apostles and the prophets. The Catholics cannot produce the passages from the Bible for their doctrine of successors simply because none exist. The Catholics are to sustain their idea of successors. They must produce the passages which plainly and openly reveal it. Anyone who teaches a doctrine not written in the Word of God incurs the displeasure and condemnation of God. Catholics claim that the present-day bishops and priests in the Catholic Church are successors to the apostles, being inheritors of their power and authority. This cannot be true. Catholic bishops and priests were not promised the power from on high, nor commanded to wait in Jerusalem to receive it, such as in Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1 state, they have no authority because they are not inspired of the Holy Spirit, nor are they eyewitnesses of Jesus. They cannot prove their authority by speaking in tongues and prophesying and working miracles. They are not the chosen ambassadors who were selected to deliver God's message or the faith to mankind. Moreover, they cannot be successors to the apostles and the prophets because the only infallible succession to them are the inspired writings. The above words from scriptures the Catholic popes tried to claim for themselves were in reality only addressed to the twelve apostles. They were not addressed to popes or Catholic bishops and priests, and it is sinful and wrong to apply the passages to them. But this is done repeatedly in the Catholic Church as they try to prove their man-made doctrine of successors. No passages in the Bible ever makes mention of successors of the apostles after the apostle John. They referred to the apostles and prophets only, and to apply them to anyone else is to twist and pervert the word of God. The Bible says the wrath of God rests on all those who do such. Galatians, 2 John chapter 9, and Revelation chapter 22. The church does not need apostolic successors. The church needs the writings of the apostles accurately recorded and preserved for us. And that is exactly what God has provided in his written word, the Bible. Supported by Ephesians 1.13, Colossians 1.5, and 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Corinthians 11, again we're reminded, For they are false prophets, deceitful workers, distinguishing themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. It is no great thing, then, if his ministers disguise themselves as ministers of justice. If the papacy isn't the office of Peter's apostolic successors, where did it come from? A look at history shows that it's far more a product of the Roman Empire than of Peter's ministry. The Roman imperial pattern was the influential blueprint that shaped the papal institution from the 4th century onward. Sometimes it can be painful to realize what we have been following is not truly biblical Christianity but a smattering of it mixed with blatant paganism emanating from ancient Babylon and the worship of false gods rather than the God of the Bible. But if we are truly searching for truth, we must continue our search and expose the worship of the Babylonian sun god and other false idols within Roman Catholicism today. We've already seen the phallic symbols of the church. As you can see here they proudly display in the Vatican courtyard there. And from seen up above an aerial view, the phallic symbol is centered in the sun god symbol as seen in this picture here. Around the phallic symbol is this sun god wheel as explained in this picture here. The Catholic Church has adopted many of these symbols of the sun god and have surprisingly no shame in displaying these symbols. Would an apostle of Jesus Christ have anything to do with these pagan idols and symbols? The popes proudly take the lead in displaying their various sun god worship symbols before their faithful followers. All of the nations surrounding the nation of Israel in ancient times were involved in sun worship. In Egypt, the sun god was called Amun-Ra, in Mesopotamia, Shamash, and in Canaan, Shemesh. One of the Canaanite cities conquered by the Israelites was Beth Shemesh, House of the Sun. 
which may have been a center of sun worship, as stated in Joshua chapter 19, verse 22. The Babylonians and Assyrians were also involved in sun worship. As pervasive as it was in the surrounding nations, sun worship was forbidden to Israel. The first chapter of Genesis sets the sun in proper context as a creation of God that he made to serve the needs of mankind. Genesis chapter 1, 14 through 19. <clears throat> Worshiping the sun is a serious sin according to Deuteronomy chapter 9, 14 and Deuteronomy 17, specifically forbidding the worship of the sun. Let's read Deuteronomy chapter 17, starting in verse 2. Here God says, If there is found in the midst of you inside any of your gates that Yahweh your God gives you, a man or woman who does what is evil in the sight of Yahweh your God in transgressing his covenant and has gone and served other gods and worshiped them or the sun or the moon or any of the army of heaven that I have not commanded. And it is told you that you have heard of it. Then you must inquire diligently and behold, if it is true and the certain thing that such abomination is done in Israel, then you must bring forth that man or woman who has done this evil this evil thing to your gates, even the man or the woman, and you must stone them to death with stones. The penalty for disobedience to God on this issue of sun worship was to be put to death. Yet the popes have no qualms of conscience for embracing these same pagan symbols as leaders of their church. Here are some examples of the Catholic Church also worshiping Mary. Notice the similarities of the pagan goddess Isis with Horus the child and the Catholic Church's veneration of Mary with the sun disk behind her head. Above Mary, you can see the mother-child pagan worship of Tammuz, Semiramis, and Nimrod also shown with the same sun disk. Nimrod and his mother Semiramis became the chief entities of worship as a Madonna and child. This belief and practice spread to Egypt where the names of the gods were Isis and Osiris. The son Osiris was born, interestingly, on December 25th. In Asia, it was Cybele and Dionysus. In Rome, they were called Fortuna and Jupiter. Throughout the world, we still find the remnants of mother and child worship to this day. It's no surprise that the same system still exists in modern times, and it's alive and well in the Catholic Church. Worship of mother and child spread from Babylon to the ends of the earth, but were called different names in the languages of the various countries where their worship appeared as the generations passed. Many of these are recognizable, such as Fortuna and Jupiter in Rome, Aphrodite and Adonis in Greece, and Ashtoreth, Astarte, and Molech slash Baal in Canaan. Popes of the Roman Catholic Church command that their followers worship Mary, but is this demand of the Pope biblical? The Bible is absolutely clear that we are to worship God alone. The only instances of anyone other than God receiving worship in the Bible are false gods, which are Satan and his demons. Peter and the apostles refused to be worshipped, as mentioned in Acts chapter 10 and 14. The holy angels also refused to be worshipped in Revelation chapter 19 and chapter 22. Their response was always the same. Worship God alone. Roman Catholics attempt to bypass these clear scriptural principles by claiming they do not worship Mary or saints, but rather they are only venerating them. While well, using a different word doesn't change the essence of what is being done. A definition of venerate is to regard with respect or reverence. Well, nowhere in the Bible are we told to revere anyone but God alone. Nothing wrong with respecting those faithful Christians who have gone before us, as mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. There's nothing wrong with honoring Mary as the earthly mother of Jesus Christ either. The Bible even describes Mary as highly favored in Luke chapter 1 verse 28. At the same time, there is no instruction in the Bible to revere or worship any man or any woman because doing so is in direct violation of the scriptures. When forced to admit that they do, in fact, worship Mary, Catholics will claim that they worship God through her by praising the wonderful creation that God has made. Mary, in their minds, is the most beautiful and wonderful creation of God, and by praising her, they are praising her creator. For Catholics, this is analogous to directing praise to an artist by praising his sculpture or painting. The problem with this is that God explicitly commands against worshiping him through created things. 
We are not to bow down or worship the form of anything in heaven above or earth below. Clearly stated in Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 5. Romans chapter 125 could not be more clear where it says, They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Yes, God has created wonderful and amazing things. Yes, Mary was a godly woman who was worthy of our respect. And no, we are absolutely not to worship God vicariously by praising things or people he has created. Doing so is flagrant idolatry. Another way Catholics venerate Mary and the saints is by creating statues and images of her. Many Catholics use images of Mary and or the saints as good luck charms, as you see in this picture here. Any cursory reading of the Bible will reveal this practice as flagrant idolatry in Exodus chapter 20, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 John chapter 5. Rubbing rosary beads is also idolatry. Lighting candles before a statue or portrayal of a saint is also idolatry. Burying a Joseph statue in hopes of selling your home and countless other Catholic practices, they are all idolatrous practices. On September 2, 2014, Pope Francis openly stated from his Twitter account that any Christian who does not feel that the Virgin Mary is his or her mother is an orphan. Pope Francis is essentially saying that anyone who will not worship Mary as their mother is not a real Christian, yet there is not one scripture that sustains this idea. In fact, there are many, many scriptures that oppose this absurd statement made by the Pope. In 1854, the papacy declared Mary as sinless, and in 1951, they stated that she had now ascended up into heaven, where she was then crowned Queen of Heaven. Interestingly, the Bible clearly shows that the resurrection does not occur until the return of Christ, so the Catholic Church is showing her ignorance of Scripture once again. According to Catholicism, the Virgin Mary now acts as a mediator between God and humanity. Whenever humans sin against God, they must confess their sins to the Pope and then hail Mary or worship Mary 50 times or so, depending on the severity of what they've done, in order to be forgiven for their sins. But according to the Bible, isn't Jesus the only mediator between God and man? After all, Jesus clearly told the following to his disciples, John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. For the Pope to make such a statement is a direct challenge to the authority of God's scripture. But instead of the Pope realizing that he must be wrong on the issue and that he contradicts the word of God, he instead tells the people that they are not translating the message right and should trust what he says the Bible is trying to tell us. Again, this is the problem when people follow men. Loyal Catholics blindly follow whatever the Pope tells them because they think he is some special apostle when he is not. This is the problem with all organized religion and their leadership of hierarchies. People stop thinking for themselves, they stop reading their Bibles, they just trust in men or a man, and they trust that whatever this person tells them is good enough for them to believe. This is being spoon-fed and childish. People need to take spiritual responsibility for themselves and study the Bible for themselves, not just believe these hierarchies of men. Although there are many good Catholics out there, indeed good people who love God, Catholicism is a deeply deceptive religion that disguises itself as Christianity but slowly eases its followers into serious idolatry, the worship of pagan gods. Okay, I'm going to end this video here. I like to try to keep my videos to around 30 minutes if I can. So the next video, part three on the Catholic Church, I will continue speaking about the Catholics' worship of Mary in further detail. So stay tuned for that, and thanks very much for watching.